Now, it, it's, I mentioned just now that it's important to obey, but let me tell you something as a, a, a facet of obedience that is often uh, underestimated. It's the willingness to say yes to things that are great and glorious, but that have a stigma, a God-orchestrated stigma on them. People think of obedience in terms of a divine mandate, mostly in terms of I'm going to pray hard, give a lot, you know, go to prison and die a martyr. And, you know, they think of obedience as rising up in a certain kind of way, but there's an, an issue of obedience where the Lord says, will you bear the stigma of something new, something vast, something unprecedented, something unfamiliar? And so often, in Genesis to Revelation, the line of demarcation was not the person willing to pray and fast. It was the line of demarcation was over the issue of willingness to bear the stigma of something new. Something new has many surprising traps around it. And the traps, uh, I mean, I don't mean they're, they're, uh, the Lord's trapping us, but there's many, when, when things are new, then that brings change. When things are changed, then people in old positions, they get stirred, and all kinds of dynamics happens at all kinds of levels, and it comes down to many times an issue of willing to, the willingness to be able to bear the God-orchestrated stigma in something dynamic and something good, and people think it's, well, who wouldn't say yes? Well, everyone says yes on the front end until it starts coming down. And uh, it's an important thing that, that we understand that. Now we're here <clears throat> this 50 days, again, just reminding us what we're doing. We're in 50 days of seeking the Lord as a IHOP family. And these, last, these final 12 days we're coming to, to hear because uh, the Lord often called the people of, of God together to remember, to hear and remember so that they would not be afraid, actually. We think it kind of so that we'll be motivated. It's act, at the end of the day, it's so we're not afraid because what God has said is going to come to pass. And it's good to be motivated. But it's more than motivation. It's so that we won't be afraid. We will remember. The first two nights of this, we're on the seventh session here. The first two nights, I, uh, I mean, I did a lot of overlapping in each of the six nights before this. But the first two nights... I would summarize it as giving kind of the global setting of what's happening in the earth. Conflict is coming globally in the secular and political and military arenas, but glory of God's coming to the church globally. That's what I really covered the first two nights. The second two nights, uh, I talked about a theme I'm going to continue to, to mention, is that the Lord is, is uh, made a point. He emphasized that He wants a people in this part of the earth... Kansas City and the Midwest to rise up and believe they have a destiny with God to participate with. And again, it's not just so they feel good about themselves and they finally got something that isn't boring. That's not the real bottom line what this is about. It's so they won't be afraid when it actually comes down. They will have participated with understanding. Then the last two nights, I've looked at really the, uh, the nature of our mandate as related to preaching. It's going to be powerful it's going to have a groaning intercession, the Holy Spirit gifted groaning intercession. It's going to be a gift of God. It's going to touch multitudes. It's going to have different facets, a, par a bridal paradigm, a judgment paradigm, uh, different dimensions to it. So I've, I spent the last two nights talking about the preaching end of our mandate. Now tonight, the seventh session, I want to talk about uh, the heart response the necessity, and again, this is tricky because when we think of heart response, we think of as we know it today, rising up and just going hard today. And it's actually in some ways, it's just different. It's different when the Lord's purpose begins to unfold in the manifest way because then the pressure points come to a head and, and the battles are different. Now, in, in these seven sessions that we covered plus the five that are coming, just so you know, there's no conceivable way you could remember it, keep it sorted out, uh, the dates, the times. It's they're really we're here in a time like this for impartation, number one, and secondly, to create the tapes which become a family archive, so you can review them, one here, one there, as the Lord highlights them. It's really to create a resource 
for later. This is a 12 days of impartation, but the resource is created so that three years from now, when the Lord's saying, hey, you know, the Holy Spirit's highlighting this one point. I want to go and hear that part again. So don't uh, think about uh, you're supposed to get it. If you're not dizzied by the information, well, then you're not listening. I'm dizzied by it, and I live through every step of it, and I, and I get up here, and I go, oh, my goodness, this is overwhelming, and it came more just one little piece at a time, and I can't imagine if you're new here, what, you know, it's like your hair must be blowing back, you know, going, what on earth, we got six more sessions to go, I mean, tonight is the one, then five more, okay, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2, and tonight we're aiming for the heart, the heart response, and it's not the heart to be dedicated it's actually the heart to be fearless. It's the fearless heart as the power, as the uh, promises are actually manifest. It's really having a fearless heart. We've talked about the dedicated heart other times, the fasting, the praying, the saying yes, but I'm talking about fearlessness in the days to come. So this won't be as, as uh, it will be interesting tonight, but really relevant in the days to come. Okay, in Acts chapter 2, very strategic chapter. Not going to uh, uh, qualify it, not going to prove it. I, I've done it several times over the years because it's one of those chapters you just got to preach on for your whole life. Acts chapter 2, it's uh, what's happening. The whole, it's the day the Holy Spirit is available to people in a general way. First time in history, the Holy Spirit, it's the, the breaking in of the kingdom age in the, in, 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 uh, uh, in the book of, book of Acts, obviously, it's Acts 2, in the early church. And there's three manifestations that are very significant because when God, when God initiates the Holy Spirit's activity at the first covenant in the early church, these three activities of the Holy Spirit are going to be, come to fullness at the consummation. If these things were introduced at the introductory time, they're going to be in fullness, and that's the point I'm making. And there's three basic things here in Acts chapter 2, uh, uh, wind, fire, and wine. Wind, fire, and wine are the three principal manifestations of divine activity when God is uh, introducing the kingdom at the new covenant. And those are the three primary manifestations that he's going to sum up uh, things in the natural history before the coming of the Lord. Verse 1. Now the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord in one place. And it's interesting the church of Jesus was in unity in prayer uh, as they're uh, experiencing these things. And the end time church will be in unity and in prayer as these three different dimensions break in upon them. Verse 2. Suddenly. And the suddenly of God is all over it. Malachi 3. Suddenly. And that's how these three things will come. The suddenly of God in, uh, anyway, it's a big subject. I don't want to, I, I got some important stories, so don't preach, Mike, okay. The suddenly of God. Suddenly there's a sound of a mighty rushing wind. The wind of God breaks in. And it filled the whole house. Now in Acts 4, this wind shakes the building. And I don't, I don't mean the wind blew and they felt the wind when the building shook, but the wind speaks of the, uh, uh, the uh, power demonstrations of the Holy Spirit. The, the, it's the realm where the angels break in. It's when the winds of God are blowing. And, and again, I could uh, take 15 minutes and talk about each one of these where all the verses in the Bible, uh, I mean, many verses in the Bible on each one of these, but I'm not going to. It's the realm of the supernatural demonstration of, of when heaven and earth, the two realms, are, are overlapping and the angels appear, the open heavens, the, the dynamic manifestations are the wind. That's the wind. Uh, verse 3, then appeared to them fire, tongues of fire. Fire is resting on them as they're speaking in tongues. Now notice, the fire appears to them. They see it with their eyes. And number two, it rests on them. So it's an anointing that's on them, burning fires on them. They feel it on them and they see it. And then, where's that verse at about wine? Hmm. Anyway, I don't have it marked. It's in there. Third, oh, it is. Oh, that's the page is over. Okay. Okay, they are full of new wine. They were mocking the wine of the Spirit. Verse 13, I had to turn the page. 
And uh, uh, the wine of the, wine of the Spirit, that's important. And the wine of the Spirit touches the heart and, and heals and restores and makes glad and restores rejoicing. There's many things. Okay, those are three things to really just uh, remember as we, uh, as we go on tonight. Okay. In April 1984, April 1984, we had been now nearly a year. It's been nearly a year since the solemn assembly of May 83. Where the comet came, the angel Gabriel, Daniel 9, the Daniel 9, uh, Joel 2 reality, which has shown up all through the prophetic history. And uh, maybe one of these sessions, I'll just give them one, two, three, four, five times where the Joel 2, Daniel 9 show up together. But uh, we've been going a year now. And uh, uh, the November, Howard Pittman, uh, a revelation from heaven on November 15th. When, when this happens, you'll never doubt again. And, and so we're, 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 we're kind of going in there. I mean, we're going for it. We're, we're, we're steady. And what I really mean by going for it is we're not quitting. That's kind of really what I mean. And, you know, sometimes that's all the Lord says. I just don't want you to quit. If you just keep saying yes, just don't quit and you win. It's pass or fail test. You know, you don't get an A or a B or C. You get pass or fail. And, and, and when we look, I look over this, the Lord made it clear to us. He said, pass, good pass and then you go delete let's just get rid of all the files then okay we pass just let's not any more information come up on the screen how many of you relate to what i'm saying it's pass or fail we passed it's over then uh we're clear it's a worldwide movement that we're laboring for and, and that's important because you do it different if you think it's going to be a a a, a local church revival or a worldwide movement. Now, not a worldwide movement that we're single-handedly birthing because we believe in the international family of affection, something the Lord spoke very strong on a number of occasions. We're doing this together with our brothers and sisters in China and South America and, and, uh, and Africa and all over Asia and Europe. Every, we're in this together. So the things I'm talking about, yeah, though we have a real important mandate in Kansas City and in the Midwest, very, very focused mandate, uh, we are in this thing with the whole body of Christ that's saying yes in their local areas to the same kind of truths and things that are going on. So now we know that we're laboring for something more than a local break-in of the power of God. We're laboring for something that's going to result in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're talking about this is the big one. Okay, this isn't a little season of refreshing, something that's going to go till the end and end up with fire in the sky, not just fire on the prayer meeting. Second Thessalonians 1 8, fire fills the sky before it's over. We're crying out, How long? How long, Lord? How long till the manifestation begins? Because uh, the Lord told us it'd be a season of drought. Remember in the summer of 83, the three month drought said there's a season of drought. I will break it when, when I sovereignly determine I will not be one day late. So, so I have this, this uh, unrelenting uh, question How long? How long? And what will it look like, Lord? I, I want to have understanding so I can cooperate with it. And here it is in April 1984. It's on a Saturday morning. I remember it so well. Uh, I'm laying in bed, wide awake, just sitting there pondering, lying there pondering. And uh, just talking to the Lord. And I was actually uh, concerning myself with this because, you know, it's been coming up on the year anniversary of the solemn assembly for May 3. He's like, Lord, how long? And this is, I mean, this was absolutely shocking to me. I hear awake out loud, the audible voice of God. Now I've heard the audible voice of God three times in 30 years. And, uh, so it's not, my point is, uh, it's, it's, I don't hear the audible voice of the Lord very much. It's not like a, a something that, you know, Bob Jones w would have heard the audible voice of the Lord four, five, ten times a year sometimes. Or m maybe not quite that much, but a lot. And, and so this is a, a very unusual experience. Like thunder, it's like 20 miles away, and it's like coming right next to me. It's like, a, it's like in stereo. It's a strange dynamic. It's thunderous and loud like it would crush you, and it's coming from a distance and yet it's thunderous, but not, it's not going to crush you coming right next to you. And so it's, a, it's an odd thing. And it's the strangest thing, but I'm just going to tell you what he said because I can stand for it because the Lord said it. He just said this statement like thunder. He said, call Bob Jones. That was it. 
I know that's odd, but that's just what he said. Call Bob Jones. I was so awed by the voice. And so I talked to Bob uh, a little bit later, and uh, Bob says, Mike, today's a very, very important day. Of course, I haven't told him that I was told to call him. The reason the Lord wanted me to call him because the Lord wanted me to believe what he would say. Now, you'd say, why didn't the Lord just tell you the Lord wants team ministry? Number one, the Lord wants us needing one another. He sets up the, uh, the uh, uh, dispensing of information so that we need one another, that we love one another, that we walk in humility with each other. And uh, that's just the order of his kingdom. And I'm happy with that order. I'm happy with, uh, there's, a, there's groups all over the world. We need them. They need us. And God orchestrates, uh, the, the, the way he runs his kingdom, we have to cross-pollinate. We have to reach over into other spheres or we can't have all that God has for us. We, uh, he builds it that way. We reach to other uh, streams in the body of Christ because we're hungry for what they have. And you know what happens? We accidentally fall in love with them. We didn't even mean to fall in love with them. We were desperate for the anointing that was on them. And we got to know them. We go, I really like you. And the Lord goes, that's it right there. That's it right there. And it, he wants us all needing one another. He, that's it's his heart. And so... Uh, uh, it's a very normal thing that some will, some prophets will hear along certain lines and other prophets will hear along entirely different lines. Some will hear about international and national things far more than personal. Others will hear about personal things. Others will hear about ministry things and what's on God's agenda for the future. And some hear a little this, a little that, but there's all kinds of emphasis and, and, and I don't think that we need to uh, try to define who is what, just know there's all the fragrances flowing together. And the Lord just, you know, and I don't try to sort it all out. I just, anybody that the Lord's touching and they got something, I go get it. You know, I just make it simple. I don't want want it all uh, defined. And so I talked to Bob that day. And Bob says, he goes, today's a very, very important day. He goes, I had a really powerful uh, visitation from the Lord. And the Lord wants me to give it to you. And it, it was the one, you know, time I got to say, I know, you know, that I, I actually knew that, you know, because the Lord wanted me to believe this. That's why I heard the, because Bob could have told me and it would have been convincing anyway, but he really wanted me to believe this because he wanted it in the, in the genetics of what we're doing. He, cause he wants, he wants this story to be such that some of you really believe this the way it came down. And I said, what happened, Bob? He says, you know how Peter in Acts chapter 10 was taken up in a trance where he, uh, in a trance, you experience it like you're really experiencing it. And uh, in a trance, you're, I, I've had a trance or two in my days. And in a trance, just to give a little instruction, you're awake. Like, uh, that, uh, I haven't had a lot of them, but uh, a couple of them, where I'm in prayer, and I have the sensation of falling asleep. But in the sensation of falling asleep, I hear everything going on around me, but I'm fully experiencing something far away in a dream state. But you hear uh, the people talking around you. You hear the people praying on the mic and you're going, I am totally awake, but I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a full experiential mode, like a high level, like a digital, I mean, like a high level crisp dream experience, but you hear everything around you. And when the, when the trance is over, you're instantly alert, meaning it's, you're instantly right there, fully alert and awake. It's not like you're waking up from a sleep. It's not, it's a very different thing than a dream, but it has a, a, uh, a powerful, uh, 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 experiential dimension and you can be far away and, and yet you're hearing everything going on around you. It's, it's quite an odd thing. How many of you have ever had a trance, uh, by that? And I don't mind that you might define a trance different, but I'm talking about a trance like Peter had in Acts chapter 10. Had several of those, and it's strange when it touches you because you're kind of not a hundred percent sure what happened because you're just there dream. I mean, you're just there praying, Lord, and all of a sudden you're experiencing fully experiencing it in a technicolor dream, and yet you're hearing everything. And when it's over, you're going, "What was that?" And that's kind of a little bit of that realm when Bob says, "I was there," you know, because you really are doing something, but you're really in a touch with everything that's going on around you. Okay, so Bob's taking up this trance. He says, I'm, I'm uh, caught up and I'm in Joseph's dungeon in Genesis 40. And you can just write that verse down, Genesis 40. You know, Joseph is in the dungeon with the cupbearer and the baker. And the Lord said, uh, in this dungeon, the cupbearer, there's two guys in the dungeon with Joseph. 
And Bob said they represent two different types of ministries that are under accusation. They're under accusation. They're being accused of poison. Because in the real story, the only reason the cupbearer is in the prison in, in, in a real live situation, because the, the king, the pharaoh, thinks he's poisoning the wine. That's why a cupbearer goes to prison, because there's poison in the wine. And the only reason a baker goes to prison is because there's poison in the bread. He said there's two different ministries that are going to come forth, and both of them are going to be accused of, uh, of having poison in their ministry. He goes, however, one ministry, it's a true accusation, the baker, they really do have poison in the bread. They really do. But the cupbearer, they don't have poison in the wine, but they get accused of it, and they're both in prison for a season. And uh, then the Lord speaks to Bob in this dream and says, I'm going to exalt the cupbearer to serve wine in the presence of the king. He says, I'm going to exalt the cupbearer, the ministry of the cupbearer. So God says, I'm going to exalt the ministry of the cupbearer. I'm going to release the ministry of wine first. And the Lord tells Bob the reason he's going to exalt the ministry of the cupbearer is to bring forth humility. Now, this, you know, you got to stay with this because uh, it, it, it's profound, but it takes you, it just takes, just stay with it because I'll, I'll tie it all together in a few moments. So keep the, the pieces uh, clear. The reason God's going to exalt the ministry of the, of the cupbearer or the ministry of wine is in order to establish and to strengthen humility in the church. The serving of the wine is going to reveal the hearts of the people of God. The serving of the wine is going to reveal the hearts of the people of God. And what God's doing is producing humility. He's going to cause humility to grow. Now, here's, here's uh, 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 how the Lord works. He reveals the mind, I mean, he offends the mind to reveal the heart. And what the Lord did is he releases the ministry of wine, some of the different manifestations of the spirit. He wants to offend the mind of the body of Christ. That's his agenda in serving the wine. It's not a, an accidental byproduct. It is his agenda in serving the wine. He is, he is like going up to his people and he's kind of like pushing them, provoking them a little bit. Because he wants their heart to be revealed. Now the Lord did this all the time in his earthly ministry. He offended the minds of his followers and of his resistors in order to reveal their heart. Because when the mind gets offended, if you're hungry, you stay with it. If you're a professional, and that's all you are, just a professional ministry, I mean a professional spirit is what I mean. Or if you're just an academic, meaning you're in, the, you're, you're in the kingdom of God, you're in the ministry, and you're just a, a knowledge broker. You know, you're just trying to get more knowledge to tell the next Bible study how much knowledge you got, and, and you, you got a debating spirit, and, there's, and, and the, the real drive is, is the crowning moment when you can unveil more knowledge. So that the masses are wowed and wooed with how you're just so incredible compared to everybody else. And there's a lot of people in the ministry so they can hit that realm of knowledge. And the people are going, whether their little Bible study is 10 or 10,000 or their TV, radio. So people go, wow, you really have it. And that's an academic approach to the kingdom of God. And there's many, many, many of God's servants, though that's, they would never use that language. The drive, one of the fundamental drives in the way they lead, the way they prepare, what they do with their time is to acquire knowledge, to dispense it, to get adulation and adoration and to get prominence. And and though most of them aren't even in, in touch with that, that's a driving reality when they wake up in the morning that helps them go to work in their ministry. Some are a professional spirit. It's not that, but they just want to, they're political. They just want to keep their positions. They, they want to keep their honor. It's not that they want to be known as the real smart one with all the new insights. It's just a professional spirit, which means they carry their ministry in a way where they're trying to make sure job security is everything. Keeping things going in a way that keeps them in a job is a critical reality, even if they're not honest enough to be that blatant about some of their motivations. It's not all their motivations, but it's a big one. It's too big. 
And so what the Lord told Bob is that the Lord is going to offend the mind of his people on purpose. He's going to offend them because he wants the, uh, the people, he, even the ones that are serving him for wrong reasons, and they always got a little bit of right reasons, but the right reasons aren't strong enough. They're, they're too secondary. I mean, they, everyone's got a couple good motives in there, but the other motives are too strong. They're too, they're, they're, they're too dominant. But also the hungry. He wants to offend the hungry too to make them more hungry. Like, for instance, here's one of the uh, classic examples of Scripture. In John chapter 2, Jesus walks in the temple. He's got a little group of apostles. He walks right in. He goes to the academics. And again, I, I'm talking about an academic spirit. You can be an academic and have a devotional spirit. So I don't, I'm not picking on people's study. I, I quite appreciate those guys. I read their books all the time. I love to read commentaries. So I, I love the people who have produced that gift of the body of Christ. I'm not talking about academics. I'm talking about a spirit. And I'm not talking about somebody who's in the profession called ministry. I'm talking about a professional spirit in ministry that's uh, preoccupied with job security and increasing their sphere. And they'll, take, uh, they'll live with little compromises as long as their sphere stays the same or grows a little bit. They'll live with compromise. And the Lord says, that's not going to work, not where this thing is going. And so uh, uh, the Lord uh, walks in in John chapter 2 to the temple. And uh, there's some of the academic spirit, the political spirit here, even his apostles. And they said, okay, uh, he does these miracles or whatever. And, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, he's kind of being noised abroad, you know. And he walks in and they said, okay, who are you? You know, and they said, well, you know, the Sadducees and Pharisees. Oh, he's a new preacher. He's from Galilee. He's been a carpenter. He just quit his job a few months ago and kind of disappeared on a long prayer retreat out in the wilderness. And he's back and. He's kind of like dropping in, going to do his first conference in Jerusalem. There he is. You know, he's just new in town. Nobody even knows him yet. Just a little bit of going on here and there. And a few excited people. And got Nathaniel. He told him a thing or two. And did the Cana wedding Galilee thing. And, and uh, so he looks at him. And they go, well, hey, how you doing? Uh, good to have you in town. Uh, what seminary did you go to? And uh, uh, he takes out his whip, cleanses the temple, knocks everything over. And he did, he's doing this on purpose. This was not accidental. He, didn't, he wasn't overtaken and lost wisdom. It's like, in, you know, I can see Peter. Peter goes to him. This is made up, of course. Jesus, listen. I know a couple of these guys. If you give them a chance, give them, you know, Bethlehem, you know, Micah 5, 2, born in Bethlehem. Give them some of the prophecies about you. Let's, let's get a little private with, uh, meeting with some of the real devout ones. Call out a few words of knowledge. Tell them the dream they had last night. Show them your stuff. Present your case. Unlock Isaiah 53. Let them pray on it a week. And I tell you, we can have a movement in Jerusalem. Of course, that's a made-up conversation. But Jesus, the answer is no, no. He goes in, knocks tables over. They don't have a clue. He doesn't want anybody to have a clue. Because he's going, even his own disciples, this is my opinion, are going... Jesus, you're really shooting down the conference ministry right now by what you're doing. This is going to really be hard to set up shop in Jerusalem, and this is the key city. And Jesus is looking at them. Again, this is my made-up uh, uh, conversation, and he's saying, if you are hungry, stay with me to his own disciples. If this doesn't excite you, I've given you every reason to move on. He looks at the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, professional spirit and says, I've given you every reason to get rid of me if you want. But if you're hungry, you will fight against the stream. Your desperation, your hunger will make you press to get the other answers that is in my heart. I mean, what's security? Of course, when you do Genesis 1, you do that. You gotta, you're a very secure person. And so the Lord tells uh, Bob uh, that he's going to release the ministry of wine first. Of the three ministries of Acts 2, the wine's coming first. And one of the reasons, I mean, God is going to renew and refresh and make happy and give joy the ministry of wine. But he wants, he wants the body of Christ to choose humility at, every, at all the levels. Now, here, here's the, uh, there's two, two bad, bad things about this. Bob says, and the Lord told me this that the Lord's going to begin in 10 years. And he says in number two, he's going to begin with wine. Now, here's the two bad things. Number one, I'm, I'm, you know, I was 27 when we started uh, this fast, and it's a year later, I'm 28. I go, 10 
years. You know, I've only had my driver's license 10 years plus. I go, Bob, I go 10 years. I'll be like 38. I'll be disqualified. I'll be so old. It won't matter. 10 years. I mean, for a 28-year-old, 10 years is another world. I, I looked at Bob. I was crying out. That se- oh, I mean, the whole year, of course. I mean, I was preoccupied after the comment and the drought. When's the drought breaking? Every- that very morning, I'm when, when? The Lord says, in 10 years. That is a really burdensome answer to a 28-year-old when you're just on year, you're starting year one. It starts right there. And Bob says, oh, 10 years will be here for you know it. I go, Bob, you're old. I'm young. 10 years isn't, that is, that's horrible news to me. Bob says it's really not because nothing is ready for what's going to happen. So that's problem number one. But it ends up stabilizing me a bit. I mean, it's really bad news, to be honest. And I struggle. I, it hurts me. But I heard the audible voice of God to call Bob. So I'm trapped. I go, Man, I don't like this. You know, about year eight, I'm going, hey, that 10-year thing isn't so bad, you know. And uh, then the second thing that bugged me, two things, lots of things bugged me, is that it's going to be wine. I go, Bob, you know, I'm not signing up for wine. I'm a Brainerd Finney guy. You know, I want fire. I, I don't want the wine. I want the fire. And Bob says, I just... I'm just the mailman. I just tell you what I get. I go, he goes, take it up with the boss. He goes, I'm just, it's 10 years and it's wine. I'm, I'm out of the conversation, Mike. He goes, you take it up with who's leading this. I'm just telling you what he said. So I'm troubled by this. Okay. Now, 10 years passes. And I mean, this is a real clear word. It's, it's one that we've wrestled with and 10 years pass. And all of a sudden, two different centers in, in our nation, I'm, certainly not only in the world, but in America, uh, up in Toronto, that's the, that's the one we were closest to. It starts in January uh, 94. And, and about April, May, June, right in there, right at the 10-year mark, they're starting to have their first conferences right in there, whatever, I don't know the exact date, but it's right that time, everybody's going. And... Uh, so we go up there, you know, I go, okay, good, there's wine. And then the other guy is Rodney Howard Brown from South Africa. He's down in uh, Lakeland, Florida. Actually, his was in 83, and it just starts off, but he hasn't been launched to the nation yet. And just about 1984, I mean, 1994, right about the 10-year mark, spring of 94, we have one aiming for the kind of the third wavers, you know, the Vineyardite, third wave, denominational people, that's Toronto. And we got one wine, a cupbearer, uh, ministering to the Pentecostal denominations, the Assembly of God, the Faith Movement, it's Rodney Howard Brown. The Lord says, I'm raised up a cupbearer for both groups, because normally those groups don't receive from each other that well. And so uh, it was, and, and Bob uh, told me, he goes, well, this is the Lord's grace. So I'm so excited. So I go to my first meetings. I come home, Bob says, what do you think? I go, I went to Rodney and I went to uh, Toronto. I go, oh, I go, oh man, I'm like a fiery intercessor, passion for Jesus revival guy. I go, this thing is, I go, this is a little hard to take, you know, because it was just so laid back and it had a spirit of flippancy most, I mean, all through it and just light and easy and just, uh, just a lot of this and a lot of that and a lot of everything. I, and I don't mean just those two places everywhere. It just wasn't suited, suited for my personality. I'm got a little bit more on the intense side. And so I'm thinking, I go, Bob, how long is this going to be here? And he says, it's here to stay. The, the wine's not going away. The Lord's going to add fire to it. He's going to add wind to it. I think, well, let's get with it. And uh, I mean, if this is what it is, let's go for it, you know. But again, I grew up on Finney, Wesley, Whitfield, Brainerd, Edwards. They didn't do this stuff. Well, a little bit they did, but it wasn't. The meetings were very, very different than I was picturing all these years waiting. Then my friend Jack Deere, uh, he goes up and he goes, Mike, he goes, I don't really like it, to be honest. I mean, he goes to a couple of the different meetings. Again, I'm not saying this city versus that city. There's, they're all over everywhere. He goes, it's not really my style. And uh, Paul Kane uh, goes and and uh, then the lord visits him in a very very powerful way because he told jack he goes yeah i agree it's not my style but the lord uh visits him and says this is my will and he said this is what i am doing 
And uh, you must accept it and you must go with it because the Lord is creating a line of demarcation. The Lord is on purpose offending minds to reveal hearts. Now, here's what the Lord told uh, Paul Cade. He said, this is not my main menu for the end of the age, but it is the hors d'oeuvres I'm starting with. This is me. Say yes to it. The Lord made it difficult. And the Lord said, I made it difficult in the early church. He told this to Paul. I made it difficult in the early church. I raised up John the Baptist and his style out in the wilderness, this wild man with locusts and honey in a strange dress code out in the wilderness. He said, I, here's what the Lord told uh, uh, Paul Cade. He said, I introduce my sinless, matchless son of a son, the king of all kings by a man in the wilderness. And he described John in the ways, the wild hair and the dress. This is how I introduced the king of kings to the, to the planet. Because I wanted people to have to be hungry in their hearts, not decide with their minds. And I'm doing this. And the Lord told them both, I am introducing the end time move of God that will end with the second coming. And I'm introducing it with wine. It, but it's a, it's a big 20, 30, 40, 50 year, more closer to 50 than 20, 50 year plan. And this wine went all over the world. So I jumped in. I said, let's go for it. Let's just go for it. And uh, as we begin to talk about, the Lord began to speak uh, uh, more clear to Bob and Paul uh, uh, during these uh, seasons of what was going on and many, many prophetic people. And the Lord was causing unprecedented, embarrassing things to happen on purpose so the body of Christ had to decide to go or not go with the Holy Spirit. The hungry were embarrassed. And the non-hungry were embarrassed. Everybody had plenty of information to say no to it. And the Lord set it up that way on purpose. Now, I have to say there was undoubtedly there was wildfire. I'm not talking about everything everybody did. There was plenty of wildfire going on. There really was. And Paul Cain called it. He said, you know, that's, he, that's when he said that cute little statement, don't be so open-minded your brains fall out. He goes, there is a little bit of hamburger helper going around. <laughs> he says, however... However, let's not lose sight of the bigger global dimension. God is on purpose, on purpose. He's offending the mind of the devout and of the professionals to give everybody an out if they want an out. If they're hungry, they're going to press in. But everyone who presses in will be humiliated by the Holy Spirit's move. Everybody will be. And the gang that signed up to get dignified and to look good... They said, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. Okay. So that's how it began. But the Lord told Bob that in 10 years, he would, he would introduce it with wine. But it was critical to establish humility. The wine is still flowing. And in some seasons, it'll go stronger. Some seasons, it'll go less. But let me tell you this. The wine renews. Here's the positive end now, okay? Because the negative end, it was to produce humility. Oh, that's positive, but it has a negative touch to it. God was healing, restoring, renewing. He was making the human heart happy in the spirit. But I, I watched it here. I watched it all through the vineyard. I watched it all through denominations. I mean, the line of demarcation went right down the middle of all the movements. Uh, Rodney Howard Brown for the Pentecostal ones. You know, uh, John Arnott and the whole group uh, with him for the, you know, more the third wave denominational. And I mean, big churches, half said yes, half said no. And I watched it. I said, this is incredible. This is exactly what the Lord said he was going to do. But that's only the introduction. But the principle stays, it it continues. Now, the thing is going to move to fire. The thing is going to move to fire. Frank DiMazio from Portland, Oregon had a very, very powerful word at one of the, uh, uh, catch the fire conferences and i i went to a handful of them and ministered probably at eight or ten of them i mean i'm i'm so proud of john arnett i stand with him and though i have seen in the last 10 years all the renewal circles worldwide things that i think need to be strengthened some things that need to be improved i'm talking about on a global dimension the 5 10 20 30 men and women wherever they are across the earth who took the stand they are courageous they gave, they took ground for the body of christ those kind of people you don't want to you don't want to strain a gnat and swallow a camel you 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 you, you don't want to see a thing or two that could be a little more excellent you want to see the incredible nobility of standing against world resistance of the body of christ worldwide 
And I just, I just threw my lot down with that. I said, Lord, you told us I'm going with it. I, you know, my pain doesn't count anyway up there in heaven as you're deciding this. I'm lining myself up 100%. And Bob said, Paul said, Bob said in the early days, he says, it's going to be embarrassing. He says, you're going to be surprised how many fear of man issues come to the surface when the Lord begins to move. Because we think it's all about commitment to pray fast and give money and press in and die as martyrs. No, it's much more subtle than that. It's fear of man by your best friends who you've sat with in church all your days looking at you saying, explain that one. And the Lord is not going to give you the answer. You can't explain it because the explanation, God can, but the explanation, the only one he's given you is you're hungry and you're desperate. And basically, if you are and you say yes, you're implying that your best buddy for 20 years isn't hungry and is not desperate, and that's when the battle starts. And you're going, no, no, I'm not saying you're not. Well, then how could you go for this? Oh, I just, I got to go for it. I don't care. I'm going for it. Oh, so you're saying I'm not going for it. Uh, no, I'm not saying that. Well, then why are you going for it? It's God. Oh, so you're saying I'm not going with God. How? It, this is getting really confusing, God. The Lord says, it's not confusing if you just want me and you're willing to live in humility. It's not confusing. Just go with it and oh man i got more tortured in my pride dimension through the wine than i did through controversies and the lord says it's only just the beginning okay the next thing coming is fire frank damasio said if this wine he says the lord sent the wine to turn it he said i remember at the conference it was so clear he said the lord is sending wine to heal hearts renew hearts so it will it will uh oil up the intercessors he prophesied it at toronto i remember it vividly it was in i believe it was in october 1996 he got up and said this wine is to heal restore provide oil for the hearts to jump start us whatever words he used in order to build houses of prayer all over the earth he goes if the wine is is if we don't use the wine and turn it into houses of prayer, it won't become the fire burning in the lamps. And he goes, and the wine will have been a memory and will have been wasted in your experience. This was in 96. We were three years from, from IHOP starting, and I, I was struck by that. I thought that was powerful. I thought that was powerful. The fire is the conviction. The fire broke out of Pensacola. And what's the numbers? I don't know, 50,000 people, 100,000. They led to the Lord in four or five years, whatever. Fire's going to break out in the bridal paradigm and passionate, lovesick worshipers. Oh, the fire is like, ooh. That, I, was, I was trained in the theology of fire, of going after it wholehearted. It's wholehearted. But, beloved, it's not going to end in the fire. It's going to go to wind. It's going to go to wind. And the wind of the spirit, we're talking about the realm of angels, the open heavens, the realm of the supernatural way beyond the wine. It's going to be way more than people moving body parts and falling and screaming. I'm talking about, uh, it's not people moving like this. It's people like, <laughs> Philip was transported. That's what I'm talking about in Acts chapter 8. John G. Lake had experience once, I believe he was in South Africa, and he's in a praying, he's in a trance, and he goes far away to England to an insane asylum, and in the vision, he lays, he prays for the person, he casts the demon out of the insane asylum, out of this person of a praying mother there uh, in England, I, and I could have the nation mixed up, but he goes from South Africa to, uh, to England or Scotland, and it's an insane child where an intercessor mother is praying. He casts the demon out. The woman is instantly healed. The child is instantly healed of a demon. And he's back, and he gets a letter, and he says, yeah, I knew it all. And he wrote it down and told, he, uh, 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 told the people around him, he says, so-and-so on this day is set free from a demon. Now, that's a little bit of the wind dimension. The wind dimension, uh, Paul Cain said it, uh, excellent. He said, to the church without mixture, I will give the spirit without measure. Beloved, the wind of a the book of Acts is going to go far beyond. The wind is going to go far beyond what it did in the book of Acts. We're in the Acts 2, 17 generation where everybody has dreams and everybody prophesies. Everybody has dreams. Not Bob Jones and Paul Cain. Everybody, a billion people under the anointing, dreaming visions, prophesying, the three-year-old, the eight-years-old, the 60-year-olds, the ones in the hospitals, the ones in prisons that are born again. Everybody, everybody is dreaming and having visions and prophesying. What's the atmosphere going to be like in the body of Christ with a billion hot prophesying believers that love worship? 
Oh, the fill-up transport system is going to be fully activated. I, I mean it. Men and women are going to have experiences to the throne. The Second Corinthians 12, which is where I want you to go right now. Second Corinthians chapter 12. These kind of experiences, I'm going to tell you one in just a minute. A personal one. Ezekiel chapter, I mean, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, the prophet, he gets caught up to the throne. John, the apostle caught up to the throne. Daniel caught up to the throne. Beloved, if they got caught up to the throne in the old covenant and they got up, caught up to the throne in the first century, the initiating of the new covenant, what are they going to do with a billion people in an atmosphere of worship? People are going to be caught up to the throne and there's going to be so much uh, dialogue and communication between the age to come and this age and we are going to withstand against this evil empire and the greatest outrage of evil. Uh, sin is going to become fully ripe. Revelation 19, uh, uh, 17 says, sin, a cult will be ripe. Sin will be ripe. Demons will be moving. Revelation 12. The demons will be cast out of their place in, this, in the second heavens. The demons will be everywhere and the occult will be exploding. The occult world will have so many out-of-body experiences. The occult world will have such prophetic, false prophetic interaction with demons, power, curses. And you think the leader of the body of Christ, Christ Jesus, the ultimate prophet of all the ages, is not going to have a bride that can withstand the counterfeit. He will, I tell you, he will. He is going to, I assure you of that. It's going to be very, very powerful and very, very intense. There's going to be throne room prophets. There's going to, I mean, there's already, I know 10, I don't want to exaggerate, it's eight or nine. Well, I want to do this right. I'm evangelistic, I don't want to go there. I want this thing to be as accurate as possible. I know seven or eight, eight or nine, whatever the number is. Friends, prophetic men and women around the nations, a handful in America, a handful of other places that have had throne room experiences. I'm talking about seven or eight of them. There's undoubtedly hundreds out of the, you know, out of the, the eight or nine hundred million uh, believers, some say a billion, some say 500 million, whatever the real number is. There's hundreds of millions. And there's hundreds, probably thousands, probably over China. They're having these experiences like crazy in the revival breaking out in mainland China. They're having supernatural experiences beyond anything we could imagine. And I, I say hundreds. It's probably thousands of God's servants in the earth are having experiences like this. And yet the church in the Western world is almost is so cautious, so uninstructed, so without discernment, so without experience. It's just, it's kindergarten. Well, let's put it this way. It's the summer before kindergarten is where the body of Christ is right now. I'm serious in terms of the things of the spirit. When you take the church in the Western world, it is so almost utterly devoid of spiritual experiences with depth in it. Now I'm talking about spiritual experiences in the Holy Spirit that honor the Word of God, that never, not even we don't tolerate 1% one, 1 of it contradicting the Word of God. We don't allow any of it to exalt anyone but the man Christ Jesus. I mean, there's plenty of guidelines. I've taught on them over and over over the years. I don't want to lay them all out now. But I'm not, uh, there's so much fear about the realm of the Spirit in the Western world and if we don't get rid of this, which we're going to, because the Lord's sovereign is going to do it anyway, we are going to just be stuck pre-kindergarten in the things of the Spirit. That's not going to happen, by the way, because the Lord's already orchestrating our victory. And the occult world is going to be PhDs in college. It says in Matthew 24, verse 24, it says, If possible, some of the elect will be deceived. If possible, some of the elect, by all the false signs and wonders. Do you know how... Many, many people, leaders, godly, righteous leaders in the body of Christ read that. They didn't say, if possible, some. They read it, most likely the majority will be deceived. Jesus did not say, most likely the majority. He said, if possible, some. And here's what we have. We have, they're so focused on the devil's power to deceive Jesus Christ is an infinitely better leader than Satan is a deceiver. 
And wherever you and I are, it's not because we are good learners. It's because he's a good teacher. It's not because we're good followers. He's an unbelievably good leader. That's why the body of Christ is going forward. And it's, we have exalted Satan's ability to deceive, and we've minimized Jesus' ability to lead. He is the fiery prophet. You think Elijah is something. Elijah is nothing to this man of fire. All the fire Elijah has is just the flick of the little finger of the God-man, Christ Jesus, the fiery prophet. And he says, my bride will be filled with fire. My bride will know the realm of the Holy Spirit. And it's this very realm that's going to cause so much troubling of the professional spirit, the academic spirit, even among the devout who are so interested in being devout but still having their clientele all established just in right places and everybody thinking they're just the sweetest little Mary of Bethany in town, but never anything that disrupts their reputation. That's not good enough because the man leading the end time move of God is fully God. He's fully man. He's a prophet. He's full of fire and he's going to break the thing open. And if wine troubled the body of Christ, which it did, I watched so many godly people decide for it, decide against it, attack each other. And because I had the little sneak preview info uh, of the 10 years earlier about this is what's going to happen. I said, what is going to happen when wind and fire come? If this is causing this much trouble and all the, the pens were writing and the criticisms were flowing, I said, oh, Lord, this is nothing compared to what's coming. Nothing compared to what's coming. And when I begin to hear uh, Bob Jones uh, and Paul Kane and some of these tell me their experiences, you know, it's kind of real cute. I'm kind of like real, uh, real wise and smart because I was unbelieving. And everybody relates to it. Hey, I hear all the time, I love your struggle because you have to be cautious. And what they're really identifying is, is with my defiled spirit of unbelief and an unrenewed mind. That's what that is. It's an unrenewed mind with unbelief. Caution, godly caution is good. But what most people, and I always tell, I typically tell the story and develop that because God had mercy on me. He wants to have mercy on people. But they call it caution and wisdom. And you know, we can't be too careful. And it's really dressed up, repackaged, unrenewed mind, no experience in the Holy Spirit, and defiled faith is really what it is. And we've dignified it and we've called it other things, which is okay, because the Lord sometimes puts a little sugar on a pill when he gives it to you. He doesn't mind. We've dressed it up a little bit. But if we're going to really be real with God, we've got to call it what it is. We are so concerned about what our friends and our families and what our people in our, on our support list and what the people at the conference that are excited and they want to have it back. And the, the, unwrote, the unwritten code is, as long as you don't do some of that other stuff, I want to have you back and... Beloved, we're going into a place, we're going all the way. And for the third world countries, they've already decided that the Western world is still choking on the wine. The wind is coming, and so is fire. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, It is doubtless not profitable for, for me to boast. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. But I will come to the visions and revelations of the Lord. He says, I don't want to, what he means is it's not profitable. He goes, I hate this, having to tell my story to you because you're so misguided by the false apostles that were coming into Corinth. He goes, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, only God knows, this man was caught up to the third heavens. Now he's talking about himself, for those of you that are just uh, new with your Bibles and you're young in the Lord. He goes, I know such a man. He goes, whether in the body or out of the body. He says it twice. You can tell his little perplexity. He goes, you know, I don't really know for sure. God knows. But he was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible words. He heard truths. I'm at it now. I'm, I'm uh, putting a little extra in here. He heard truths that he could not, com- that God says, you can know this, but I'm not going to let you say this. It was not, uh, it was God's wisdom said, hold that truth back. Don't, that happened to John the Apostle a few times too. The angel said, you can't write that one down. You can't say that one. And he goes on. And then uh, verse 7, uh, he says, uh, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation. And there's the word, abundance of revelation. Uh, a thorn of the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, so I didn't exalt myself because the abundance of revelation really gets the job done, but it has a downside. There's a puffed up spirit that comes, but the Lord can, can uh, neutralize the equation by allowing a thorn in the flesh to have a little bit of liberty to touch you. 
And verse 9, he says, my grace is sufficient. The Lord, I imagine, is appearing to him, saying, Paul, my strength is going to be made perfectness, perfected in your weakness. Therefore, uh, Paul says, I'll boast, even though I'm having a struggle in this. I want to keep moving in the power of God, even though I have an added struggle, because I'm moving in the power of God, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell uh, an experience. Let me see. I'm getting a... Uh, I got to go get right to it here because I'm running out of time. Uh, it was uh, v- the most dynamic, uh, n- uh, dramatic supernatural experience I've ever had. This is in August 1984. And it begins in July 3rd, 1984 with Bob Jones again. Bob Jones has a powerful visitation from the Lord where he's caught up in that realm, whatever. And our, our, our uh, uh, church is over at Oldham Park on 109th and Row. So what? 15 minutes from Grandview, I suppose, 15 minutes. You know, we're in a night, for those that are visiting, it's a, it's a nice part of town. Grandview, well, one guy called it kind of the, well, it's different than Overland Park. Let's just leave it that way. I love Grandview. And so uh, we're over in Overland Park, our church is, let's say we have seven, 800 people coming on Sunday morning, and we got to, we're fiery, we're going for revival, we're praying every night. And a lot of lawyers and doctors, professionals. We have about 10 of the Kansas City Chiefs, probably 10 doctors, 8 or 10 lawyers, a lot of professional, young professionals going for revival. It's a, a professional part of town, and Bob Jones has his experience, and uh, the visitors won't be able to catch the, uh, the, lang- I mean, the uh, geography so well. And in this experience, we're on Blue Ridge and Grandview Road at the corner. Right there by Blue Ridge, or it just, it actually, it's a, a several miles, and there's a big procession going down the street, and they're going down Blue Ridge on the way to Arrowhead Stadium, because Blue Ridge begins real close to that location, and it ends at Arrowhead Stadium, and what it is, there's thousands and thousands of people lined up on each side of the road, and there's, there's the Ark of the Covenant, and the 35 uh, 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 people, because it's men and women, in one of my uh, tapes, I said men, but it, it's not accurate. I read it today. I go, that's not true. It was men and women, and they had uh, 35 apostles. Apostles are being restored today. Apostles, they're not going to write the word of God like the apostles of the Lamb. They're of a different category than the original apostles, but the apostolic ministry is vital to the great harvest. The apostolic ministry is vital to many, many, many things, and this is going to be a real issue with many streams in the body of Christ. They don't like that apostle word. That's the chief apostle is restoring apostles. That's all there is to it. Okay, there's plenty of verses on it as far as I'm concerned uh, that, that I could pull out, but I don't want to take time. So there, there's, there's, there, there's 35, he sees the number 35. That's just, I just take it, him at his word. He says he sees that number. Men and women, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders, leading the parade. Now behind this parade is a multitude of people who are pushing wheelchairs. It was the, it was the guy who had no arm, but now he has an arm. It's the person that was totally paralyzed. He's now pushing his wheelchair. It was the person on crutches their whole life. They're carrying their crutches. Oh, it's the, every type of disease has been healed and they're parading down Blue Ridge to go to Arrowhead Stadium to have a blowout worship setting where God's going to visit. And the Lord is at the front of the procession. He's sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. He's, uh, there, he's being carried by, uh, uh, several of these apostles and then there's a few behind him and then a multitude of the healed. The people on both sides, the whole city nearly, that's exaggerated, but I mean, thousands and thousands have turned out on the side to watch the procession to the city. And the Lord turns, and the Lord says, uh, from this exalted position, uh, uh, sitting on the Ark of the Covenant as they're, uh, carrying it in, He says, I'm going to reveal my glory through my holy apostles. He tells us to Bob. Now, Bob is in the stands. He's not, he's not in the deal. He's in the stands. Uh, he's not in the per- 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 uh, procession of the parade, or he's not carrying the Ark of Covenant. And he has a hospital gown on, and he's troubled. His heart is hurting over this. And he's, in, he's there in the stands, and, and an angel stands next to him. He hears the Lord say, I'm going to release my glory through my holy apostles. The angel stands next to him. He says, look down at your feet. He looks at his feet. His feet are crippled. And the angel said to him, he goes, you are Mephibosheth. You are like Mephibosheth. He said, your feet have been crippled in the battle. You've been injured, and your tutors dropped you. And he explained it to him. I don't want to go in that. That was personal about Bob. He goes, he was in a hospital gown. And Bob said, 
I want to be, the, I want to be there. And the Lord says, it's not ordained for you. It's ordained for you to be here. And he said, however, you are Mephibosheth, 2 Samuel 9, you can read it. I will see to it I, that you will dine at David's table. However, uh, you will not be leading it as you're imagining. And Bob was absolutely devastated. So Bob comes to me the next day in July. He had this experience July 3rd. Now it's so July 4th. He comes to my house. He goes, Mike, I had the most awesome, devastating experience. He goes, number one. Oh, he says, in this uh, 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 experience, the angel told me to tell it to you because he said he's going to take you to the very throne of God. You're going to visit the, I don't know, I'm adding those words. He's going to cause you to have a visitation from the Lord to see this very reality. This very, it just so happens I, I go to the very presence of the Lord. It's what happens. But the angel says, tell Mike, or whatever he said, go tell him, what's his name, <laughs> you know, uh, that I'm going to visit him and reveal this to him face to face. The Lord is going to reveal face to face. So Bob says, the Lord's going to show you this face to face. He says, you're going to have a heavenly experience. And this is the summer of 84, and I'm going, really? He goes, yes. He goes, number two, he goes, we're going to Grandview. We're on our way to Grandview. I go, well, we've been in Overland Park for a couple of years, and our whole congregation's there. He goes, the Lord didn't care about that at all. We're going to Grandview. He goes, we're going right by a, a Blue Ridge, right where it starts, somewhere over there where it starts. And he says, uh, we find, I mean, uh, he doesn't tell me this just that very minute, but later on he tells me, he says, one of the reasons we're going to Grandview is because the Lord wants us next to Harry S. Truman's house. And you know Harry S. Truman's role in the rebirthing of the nation of Israel. Harry S. Truman's house is 100 yards from the beginning place of that that march, or right, it's right there, and, and we're marching to Arrowhead Stadium, which is Truman Sports Complex, he goes, the Lord is making a point about the intercession in this city, and the stadium meetings, and the birthing, a national revival in the nation of Israel, not the, I mean, the spiritual, uh, not birthing, but breaking through, and he told me a little bit about that, but that's a, another subject that we'll spend more time on, but I just feel like that's important to say, he goes, Mike, number one, God's going to visit you, number two, he said, uh, we're going to Grandview. He goes, for sure. And number three, I'm going to get injured in the battle. He goes, and I'm in hospital gowns, and I'm not leading out front when it breaks open. He goes, I am devastated by this. And, and you know, uh, maybe lacking a little bit on, on uh, compassion, a little high on enthusiasm, I go, uh, Bob, that uh, God bless you. Could you tell me more about that visitation I'm going to get? <laughs> you, you wouldn't mind, you know, forgetting your grief for a second. I'm kind of excited right now. <laughs> Didn't exactly do that, but uh, Bob was depressed. He said, I've never had an experience so depressing. So now a month goes by. A month goes by. It's August. The uh, prophetic man, uh, Augustine, who uh, uh, met us in St. Louis and heard the audible voice of the Lord in, 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 about the whole going to Kansas City thing, he calls me. It's 1030 at night. Mike, Augustine, 1030 at night. Just came home from the night prayer meeting. Just walked in the door. Hello. He says, tonight is the visitation. The Lord's going to take you to his presence face to face. But, I mean, no one sees the Lord face to face. But, you know, the... I said, tonight, are you, is this for real? He goes, yes, for real, tonight. You're going tonight. He says, I'm calling you because the Lord told me this will be so new. You're so inexperienced. This will be so overwhelming. When it's all said and done, you will know you did it, but you just have to know another human being said it to you. Bob Jones told you, uh, we sorted that out later. He didn't say it that second, but we talked about it so many times. Bob told me, Augustine told me, and he says that it was going to happen, and Augustine said it's going to happen tonight. Okay, so I go, I go in, in the bed, go to sleep. You think, how can you? You, you just do somehow. And 2.15 uh, <laughs> in the morning, I'm just going to, the reason I'm going to describe it to you, I'm not describing it to you for curiosity's sake, because I have, I've, I've very, rarely told this in how many years since 84, it's 18 years, very, very so few times that people always ask me to tell that story, I go, nah, I don't want to get it on tape because I don't want to exalt mystical experiences, but the Lord is, is challenging me. He goes, the reason you struggled so much is because you had no grid for this, and I'm going to do this with so many people. Give them a grid so they don't have to do that kind of real cool, dignified, unbelief thing for five years. They can just enter in and begin to understand, and they don't have to stay in kindergarten for the next 30 years in the Spirit. 
I mean, there may be a, a, a college-level doctrine, but they're a kindergartner in the spirit. They're, that's, they're, they're, they're uh, malformed. What do they call that? You know, unbalanced. Th- that's bad when, when, when that happens. So uh, we need to teach. We need to instruct. It needs to be not normal to where it's trite and over-familiar, but it needs to not be so bizarre that nobody can believe it or do it. It's happening all over the world, and we're at the beginning of the beginning, and a number of you in this room are going to have those experiences. Why should you waste three years? I think I did, but I might not have, but I could have, and oh, aren't you sweet? Aren't you humble? Oh, shut up. Did you or did you? Let's Get on with it. It's about the kingdom. It's not about you and your little profile. It's about the kingdom of God. That's why I'm going to give you some some details. So we just get rid of this distracting other thing and just get it out of its way. Nothing is more important than Scripture, and nothing is more important than the exalting of Jesus and the bringing in the harvest. It's all about those kind of things. So I'm up in heaven. And I'm in this uh, room, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 room, uh, feet each way, something like that. It's all clouds, every, about the size of this room, actually. And it's all clouds. And I'm standing there, and I'm at the uh, Lord's left hand, and I'm looking straight forward. And I don't know what's happening, because as far as I know, the last thing I did is I went to sleep. Okay? I start off in my sleep, but I don't end in my sleep. And, and I'm up there, and I'm looking around. I don't, I'm looking, and I'm going, I don't know where I'm at or what's going on. And I kept touching myself. Saying, I was grabbing my arm, just wringing my arm, going, I am awake. But I, the last thing I remember is I went to bed tonight. I go, I am awake. This is the real me. This is not a dream. I said it over and over and over. And suddenly, as I'm in this big room, uh, about this size with clouds everywhere, the uh, voice of God comes, and the Lord gives me a correction. He says, young man, and he gives me this correction. And it's, it's strong, but it's not so bad. And, and I go, like, I don't. Uh, agree with it, but, or better yet, I don't understand it. Maybe that's a better way to say it. <laughs> and I'm looking forward and I'm at his left hand. I never look to, I never even look one second that direction. And I go, I don't say anything, but in myself, I, in my mind, I go, I, I, I don't understand. I don't know why this is real. And then he says it's stronger. He goes, young man. And he says it's stronger and forceful. And he says the exact same correction. Ouch, that hurt. I mean, I felt rebuked, and I, and, and I went, I don't understand. I don't understand. I say this to myself, nothing out loud, but he hears everything. And uh, <laughs> truly. And so the next time he goes, young man, he says it's stronger, almost with a, a stern. I mean, it was really painful. And I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, out loud, yes, sir. And I said to myself, it has to be right. It's God, but I don't understand it i got to get out of this room and get my head clear. But until then, yes, yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. I said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Suddenly, the clouds open up, and I start falling. Now, here's the part I want you to understand, because the occult people do this kind of, I don't mean exactly this, but they have the counterfeit of this. And the people of God in the prophetic realm, I mean, Ezekiel went from one city to another city. Philip did. It's, it's not a, uh, we, we've so exalted uh, something out of its proportion. So, uh, the Lord wants me to have the sensation of travel, not so that I can say I did it. It's not a, uh, hey, that was cool. It's because he wanted to impact me with the power of the experience. The sensation of travel, the experience of it, I was fully awake, and I experienced all the emotions of it. So I'm falling, and it's all black as I'm falling. I don't know I'm up at the top of the sky. I don't understand that. It's all black, and I fall for a moment. I don't know how long a moment is, but for a moment. And all of a sudden, I begin to see stars. And they're, and they're above me. So I was above them for a minute, I mean, for a moment. And then I fall another moment, and I look over, and I'm equal to the moon. I go, unbelievable. What is going on? And then I fall another moment, and now the moon is real little and way higher than me. And the stars fill the sky. And it's dawning on me. I'm going, wait, no stars, stars but no moon, moon and stars, little moon, little stars. <laughs> And I look down, and I see my duplex. I do. I see it. And I'm going right to it fast. I go right through the roof, just totally right through the roof. Not, I mean, when I get ready to go through it, I just kind of like tense my body like, Ugh. 
you know, but it's nothing because the spirit realm and the natural realm, they have this overlap whenever God wants it to in the sovereignty of God, and it's not a problem at all. It's only a problem for people who have absolutely no understanding of the spirit realm, and it's more real than the natural realm. And so I hit my bed. I'm wide awake on my bed now. It's the real me. Now I'm where I can, I'm comfortable. You know, I'm there. I say, I know where I'm at now. I look at the clock. It says 2.15. There's my shoes. There's everything. There's Diane. I go, I am like really awake this time. <laughs> I, I mean, this is the me. I go, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So then, then the spirit of God comes on me. I go straight up again, right to the ceiling. Awake. I know I'm awake now. I knew I was up there the first time. But I, all I remembered was the last thing I did was fall asleep. So I, it was confusing. It was my first experience. My only one like that. But I'm not proud of that because I believe this kind of thing is going to be, I don't mean just like this, just all kinds of dimensions of the creative God. So then I'm going up. The moon is real little and the stars are vast. All of a sudden, I'm right next to the moon. All of a sudden, I'm in the black. There is no stars. I'm back in the clouded room again. I'm standing there again. I go, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm... Because I have a negative emotion now because I'm in the room and, I, and that was negative a minute ago or however long it was ago. And so the, the, the negative feeling hits me again and because I didn't have it on the going down and coming up, but it, it returns to me. And all of a sudden, the clouds open right to my left over there. And this chariot comes, the clouds split open just like it did when I fell through them next to me. They split open this time, but a chariot comes. And the chariot has the full-scale clash of metal. It's like if you were at Disney World or something and the, the ride, it goes clink, clink, you know, just ching, ching. However, it was like really loud clash of metal. And I look over there and I can't, you know, because the, the clouds are equal to the door, so I can't see the wheels under it or whatever. And I'm going, what is this? And then the voice of God, the one that warned me and rebuked me, it was actually a warning. But it had the feeling of a rebuke, but it wasn't something I did yet. It was something he said, don't do. And I tell you, by the grace of God, I am not doing that. And so, uh, so then uh, uh, he, uh, the chariot opens on its own accord, the door does. And he says, the audible voice of the Lord, he says, get in the chariot. Now, I'm positive this is the apostolic ministry that Bob Jones is talking about two, a week earlier or uh, a couple weeks earlier. And I look at it, and I say the most, uh, the most unpredictable thing. I look at it, and I say with energy, I said, no. <laughs> you know, I was one of those guys that read the Elisha stories, and always said, if ever I get my moment, I'm going to go, give me the triple. None of this double Elisha stuff. I'm going for the triple decker, you know. And I get there in the moment, and I said, no. I said, no, real loud. I can't fathom it. And the Lord says, get, I mean, you think he'd say, my son, I have prepared this. It wasn't. It was strong military. <laughs> no, it had command. It had strength. And it didn't have tenderness in it. it I mean, it just didn't. Just, just to be honest. He says, get in the chariot. It wasn't like, oh, my beloved. You know, like I would. He said, get in the chariot. It had, but it didn't have a negative tone, but it was strong. It was like, ouch, I've still got the ouch on me, you know. And, and I said, I fall down on my face. I collapse. And I start screaming out. I said, it's not justice that a, that a man such as I can get in the chariot. It's not justice. And he said, it is ordained for you. So two angels that I saw with my eyes that touched me with their hands, picked me up and set me in the chariot. And the door shut. And I'm sobbing. I go, no, it's not justice. That was the big word I kept saying. It's not justice. The, the Lord, the whole thing is about mercy. That's why I'm so adamant about this thing. You're not earning this thing. I said, it's not justice. And the Lord says, it's ordained. So now the chariot begins to take off. And all of a sudden the clouds disappear. And I'm entering into an endless ocean of sapphire blue. Sapphire blue. It's endless. It's, I'm just making this up. A million miles. And I'm in it, and the, and the sentence comes to me very clear. The unveiling of the knowledge of God. This is your portion. The unveiling of the knowledge of God. And I'm going through this blue for miles and miles and miles. And then, as I begin to go into it, I hear somebody. I hear the chink, chink kind of thing, the metal clash behind me. And I heard some guy or some uh, lady cry out, no, no. I heard him say this for real. And I peek over my shoulder, 
Misery loves company. I peek over my shoulder to see, and I can't see any faces, but I see about 30 to 50 people there, which is the same number that Bob Jones saw. Bob Jones saw, said he saw 35. I don't know that I couldn't count. I looked like this and there were 30 to 50 chariots lined up in a row. I barely saw them on my peripheral vision. And there were a bunch of young people standing in line. Not, I don't mean that everybody was young, but most of them were young. And, and the first one got in and screamed, no, no. I mean, the first one right behind me. And then that one took off into the blue. And then the other one, I heard one more, no, no. I was already going far away. I could hear a no, just fate, but I heard it. And I thought, I mean, I'm, I'm joking now, but I thought, I don't know what they're doing, but I didn't really do that. I, it's nothing like that. So I go, I go into this endless, and the knowledge of God is your portion. Then it's over, and then suddenly it transitions, and I'm falling. That's my, th- you know, I went down once, came up. That's the second one-way trip. Now I'm going on my third one-way trip. And so I'm coming down, and I'm going, I see the black, and I say, I say to myself, I bet I see the moon in a minute, in a moment. And I look, and there's the moon right there. I said, man, this is amazing. And then a moment later, all the stars. And then a moment later, the moon and the stars are little. And I'm going to my house. I look at it again, just like the first time down. And I go, okay. And I go right through, and I'm wide awake. And I look at my clock. Oh, I forgot to mention. When I went down the first time, and then I knew I was awake. And that was the purpose of going down. The Lord says, I mean, he didn't say it, but I, he, I know now. I want you to know this is real. This is not figurative. This is real. And I looked at the clock when I went down the first time and said 2.15. I come back after this long experience. It's, two, it's still 2.15. Still 2.15. The Lord has made it very clear to me. That's Joel 2.15. That Joel 2.15, and I'm not going to go into that right now, but there's a, we talked about that. I've, it's, it's just clear to me. I have several reasons why I know that. I didn't know it that day, but I know it now. And so I got up. I just got up. I mean, I didn't go to sleep and kind of, kind of, segue into the natural realm. I just was there, just totally me. I go, oh my goodness. And I just got up and I said, what was that? And, and it was so clear. It's what Bob Jones saw. We are going to, so a year later, we find our building. We end up at the very location where Bob said we would be. And I'm telling you this, this second Samuel six, David was restoring the ark as the procession he saw. It's the, it's the David building his tabernacle and putting in his worshipers and singers on its way to the Arrowhead stadium. It's all the things we believe about. And I want to tell you this, that it's na- strategically 100 yards from Harrius Truman where he grew up. And there's a, there's a museum, little house museum thing that, uh, and the Lord told Bob, it is significantly related to intercession for the end time harvest across the whole earth. It's related to the stadium meetings. It's related to the Joel 2.15 fasting. It's related to, to uh, gathering. Because see, the church worldwide has to be in unity in prayer to birth Israel. It's not going to be the Midwest. It's not going to be four or five little God squad, little prayer groups. It's going to be one billion people in unity in stadiums under the anointing with angels breaking in together across the earth like a sledgehammer, bam, and knocking that door open. And the nation of Israel is going to accept their Messiah and all kinds of things are going to break out. It's not some little side thing that's going to happen. And I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out the city over here, the city over there had their story, and we'll have phenomenal interchange going, oh, my goodness, how could we have known it? And the Lord said, you wasn't supposed to. You're just supposed to love each other and find each other. When I had you find each other, do what I told you hard and go for it. But here's, I'm ending with this. I'm ending with this. Stand up if you would. 